are going to learn fun facts about Maine. And Tim O'Brien is a wonderful um, part-time Mainer. I guess <laughs> we could call you that. And he has developed a wonderful book called The Main Road Show. And it is going to be self-explanatory, and no one is better at explaining it than Tim. So please welcome Tim O'Brien. <clears throat> Thank you, Sharon. Uh, yeah, I'm part-time. Um, I, I sign MBM after my name, Mainer by Marriage. Uh, and that's my wife, Kathleen, back there uh, at the Redhead. And as you... If you like to buy any books afterwards, she'll be glad to glad to help you. Um, about five, about six years ago now, we started uh, be, during the summer, uh, just before the pandemic hit. Uh, every Thursday, we chose to go out and do a, a little road trip. We we summer up in the uh, Belgrade Lakes area, north of Augusta, and which is a wonderful starting point to go every which way throughout the state. And we started just going down roads, not knowing where we were going and just having a good old time. And I, as a photographer, I take pictures of anything that's moving or isn't moving. Uh, <laughs> thousands of pictures. Uh, so we went into it for about going into the third year, which was really in the middle of the uh, pandemic. I said, you know, I think we might have a book here because I've taken so many pictures. So then we started saying, okay, we haven't been in this part of the state, we haven't been in this part of the state. Uh, so then the next two years, we concentrated on specific areas. Me driving, taking all the photos and the notes, Kathleen being my navigator, and understanding that uh, she has to hold on because if I see something, I whip right into the driveway and <laughs> skid around a little bit, but we didn't miss anything. Uh, so anyway, we came up with the main road show, came out last year, and this is my first presentation of the year, so if I stumble a little bit, even though I wrote the, the, the thing, <laughs> I have a tendency to forget some things at times. Uh, anyway, we called it the main road show, a roadside tour of the state's history, culture, food, funk, and oddities. Uh, I didn't want to just follow every other guidebook if, that the, that's out, and there's dozens of them, uh, that says, this is nice because this right out of a brochure. So all of my comments in this book, there's a um, little over 400 photos, 450 photos in 400 different places. And we visited them all. I took all the pictures and wrote all the comments, and they were mostly written about our experience there, a little bit about the history, and as I drove in the driveway, I saw Joe, the owner, come out and wave type of thing. So it was a very personal thing for both of us, and, the, and she grew up in Maine and was, had this opportunity to really see Maine uh, and a lot of things. And Tim, how many of you have heard of Tim Sample? Well, I befriended Tim in the early parts of this, and he ended up helping me a little bit and wrote the forward to it, which is a pr worth the price of admission itself, if you know Tim. <laughs> um, sounds like I'm selling a Tim Sample book, doesn't it? Okay. All right. So my first question is, what do you think when you go over that? The Green Bridge. Ah, you know. Uh, Kathleen calls it a portal to life as it should be. And we're always... Uh, I always look over at her and she's got this big grin on her face every time we go across the bridge every spring. <laughs> How many of you have been down to the main attraction water ski show in Sanford? I guess that's up. It's, it's, it's an amazing free event held on Thursdays th uh, during the month of July on Pond One in Sanford. And these are volunteer water skiers. They help each other learn and they put on a presentation for Maine uh, for Mainers, like I say, every Thursday night free. You can just get there early. There's food trucks. You can sit on the grass around the pond, watch them. They do all these, the standard pyramids, jumping, single ski, barefoot skiing. And they, um, uh, they, they, they wave at you. Then they come out afterwards. And everybody, the night we saw it, there was an 80-something-year-old lady skiing and a 12-year-old. Uh, so it, it's all, gener all generations. And when they're not skiing, for Maine, they're out doing competition throughout New England. And they've won quite a few things from what I understand. Ah, Goldenrod Kisses. 
you know, if you if you know what that is, then you know it's all about the this candy shop down in York, on York Beach. Uh, they've been operating since 1896, and get this, nearly eight million kisses are made every year, and that's 50 tons of kisses coming out of that one shop. Uh, and as so you can. No, it's a it's a different uh, it's a different type of it's uh, they don't call it a saltwater taffy, but it's uh, got got it's more chocolatey. Okay, um, this is from the uh, Smiling Hill Dairy in Westbrook, and they have food service as well as ice cream, lots of ice cream, and you can see the picnic tables are right up against the the, the almost invisible fence with the cows. And I couldn't help but, but think when I was sitting there eating my ice cream, are these guys waiting for a thank you or, or, or what? And I have to admit that I never ate ice cream with a cow watching me before. It's, it's a truly unique experience. And talk about unique experiences. To get an adult beverage at Lincoln's Speakeasy, you have to walk down these steps. This is the only speakeasy uh, that I know of in Maine. It's in, um, it's in Portland. And it's right on Market Street. No signs, no numbers, no phone numbers, no media. It's, it's down there to the left. And when you go down, you go to the left, you walk into like a locker room. And you go, all right, now what? And then you have to stand there and figure out how to get into the bar itself. <laughs> and we were, we were down there quite a while trying to figure it out. And two people who had been there before came in and went right in, so we followed them. But it's, a, and they call it Lincoln because everything is five. You know, Lincoln's picture appears on a $5 bill. So all drinks are $5, all food items are $5, and they don't open up until 5 p.m. So take our advice, don't drink the $5 wine. <laughs> Saco Drive-In, rest in peace. Um, they went out of business uh, a couple years ago, and the property was sold to a, a trailer retailer that's going to set up a place there. And the Saco Drive-In uh, is the oldest in Maine, having operated since 1939. And it was closed for the summer of 2022, but for the season of 23, their good neighbors across the street, Aquaboggan Water Park, said who all grew up and going to this as, as kids, said, let's buy it. So they bought all the rights, they bought the sign, they bought everything, moved it across the street, and the water park set up a brand new version of the Saco Drive-In in in their parking lot. And it works out well, because they close the water park at like at five or six, and then they don't start showing until eight, and they use the same facilities, they use the same uh, concessions, and it's, it's very, very cool. And that's what it looks like today. And as a matter of fact, that's what it looked like about an hour and a half ago. We just took this picture on the way down. <laughs> and they say they're going to open the 24th, but uh, that was last week. I thought, if I'm not, but they, I did check and the Garfield movie is, is showing there. But anyway, it's alive and well. Um, and unfortunately, they didn't save the original sign. When I heard that they bought it, I thought for sure they would do it. They mimicked it, but they, they but they, I don't know what happened to the original sign, which was a, a real crime if they did away with it. Okay, uh, there's another drive, and that's up in Madawaska. It's a skyline. It's been around since 1972. And it holds the distinction of being the northernmost drive-in theater east of the Mississippi. And the Bridgeton drive-in, that's the only twin drive-in in the state. Uh, they've been open since 1957. And... Um, that picture was taken a couple years ago, but um, there's still six remaining drive-in theaters in, in the state of Maine. Uh, there was seven Skowhegan cl closed last year about mid-season. This is a, um, something that really surprised me. I had no idea it was there, and I went down to take pictures of the Bug Light Lighthouse and turned around, and this was at clear at the other end of the park. It's located in South Portland in Bug Light Park, and it's a monument to the 30,000 men and women who built more than 250 Liberty ships uh, during the early 1940s. Tremendous signage tells the story of the uh, Liberty ships, and it's, it's a great, great place to be. Uh, 
Okay, the uh, Little Fenway Park. This is a licensed replica of Fenway Park in Oakland. And that's the uh, main Little League World Series, have a lot of their uh, championship games there. And um, let me ask you, has anybody in here ever dreamed of playing in Fenway Park and knocking a home run over the big green monster in the left field? Let me, let's show of hands here. Oh, all right. Well, here you can do it because you can rent it out. And, of course, it's, I don't know how many feet, but I think it, you probably you, you can see the short outfield. Uh, so if you, if you really want to feel powerful and have somebody take a picture of you hitting over the fence, I don't know what they charge, but, uh, uh, but there's a, uh, it's used by several camps as well up, up in that area. Maine has its own Liberty Bell. It's one ton, and it's a total replica. It's on the north lawn of the Capitol building right across from the, the Blair Mansion. And it's one of the 55 replicas made in the early 1950s to help promote the sale of independent savings bonds for the war. And each state received one free of charge, and ours is listed as number 40. And it was installed on July 7, 1957, excuse me, 1950. And it's, um, I wish they would do a little more classy thing and stick a couple tuba fours under it, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, the nearest and perhaps the only camel that living near Augusta it resides at Dew Haven. That's D-E-W, Haven. That's the Domestic, Exotic, and Wild. Uh, it's an acronym for that. And it's home to more than 200 animals that have been neglected, displaced, abused, or unwanted. It's a marvelous place. Uh, and the, the Julie Miner, the owner, um, is there with Ziva, the, the female cam five year old female camel. And she go she took us around and she would call their names, all these animals, before she even got near the pen and they'd all come running to see her. And it was a it was quite a quite a nice experience. And you know, something else that big tourist which surprised me, tourist attractions for the state of Maine are signposts. <laughs> and uh, in 1996, a 17-year-old Jeff York created this particular sign as an Eagle Scout project after his parents had taken him around to other places in the state of Maine, and he saw some of these signs. He says, well, none of them have the presidents. So these presidents are in order uh, uh, of their presidency, and as you know, Maine is great using other yeah, not coming up with original names. Uh, and there's another example. And this one's in Lynchville. And this was one of Jeff's inspirations. And again, these are all real names. And then this one is in China. And as you can see here, the, uh, it's not as well kept up. It's a little more hidden. It's not quite as popular. And um, this one's up in Jackman. And it's very different, and I really like it. You notice that the arrows point in all the different directions, how many miles, et cetera, et cetera, except until you get to the destinations of heaven and hell. <laughs> Up at the top, there's no arrow. I guess it's noncommittal. But uh, they say because heaven is here and hell is everywhere else. That's, uh, it's their words, not mine. Uh, but Bishop's store is a lifeline in Jackman. And there's a lot of other signs as well. Like this one is in Vienna, over out near Mount Vernon and Belgrade and in that area. And these are all the Viennas in the world. Um, so you can see that uh, there's quite a few of those. And then just on the next block in Vienna is this one. This is my favorite, I think, of them all. It's got a little style to it and they, uh, they, they show you Belfast, all these, again, the same places. Uh, but then it's not driving mileage, but it's as a crow flies. It's probably easier to figure it out. And then the one right above that, Vienna, don't you move a darn inch. Uh, yeah. That's, uh, and that, that, that one, unfortunately, is not in the book. I discovered that afterward, but I wanted to bring it in the presentation. That's uh, the little coastal town of friendships uh, sign. And... Uh, it's mounted on the corner of the Advent Christian Church. And all of these other places are everywhere. Harmony, unity, 
union, hope, liberty, and but friendship is here. Right at the church, as a matter of fact. That's a Casco swinging bridge in, in just north upstream from Songo Lock in Casco. Uh, it was created in 1926, the swing bridge, and it's 60 foot long by 13 and a half foot wide. And that's the actual right of way for the highway. So when a um, boat comes through the lock, they blow the whistle or their horn, and this guy comes out of his little shed and pulls out this thing that he has here and goes out and cranks it until it turns sideways in the river and then the boat goes by the there's uh, stuff that's keep barricades that keep the people from driving of course into the river and then he'll crank it back up and close it and lift the lift the barricades and people go on their merry way it's the it's the only operating one in the state uh, of state of Maine right now uh, in uh, just north of the Sango uh, Dam or uh, Locks, uh, it's on State Park Road in in uh, 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 Casco, and it's two and a half miles off of Route 302. So go to 302, take the park, go back toward the State Park, and you'll 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 discover it there. One of my oddities that I like so much about this state, uh, several things, mailboxes. I really like the different presentation of mailboxes. And I also liked how people tried to sell firewood. There are some really unique firewood shops. And this is the most modernized camp firewood business we sell. They, they take uh, credit cards and they take Venmo. <laughs> and what they do is have stuff in nice tubs and, and they'll, you can take the tub with you, take your uh, wood home, and then they ask you to return the tub. Which, which I think was, was pretty cool. Old Betsy, she's at Bridgeton H Historical Society, and this is a Sears Roebuck and Company mail order motor buggy. And S Sears sold them, uh, and what they did, would do is, uh, this one cost $500 in 1909. And what they would do is pack everything up in boxes, put it on rail cars, ship it to you, would tell you what train it was coming in and all. They would unload the crate and you would have your mechanics down there and they would build that thing for you and you could drive it home. It was quite a unique thing. And if you notice the license plate, 6186, that's the number of registered vehicles in the state. This was 6,186 vehicle registered in the, in the state. And Sears was busy because they also built this house, or sold this house. They, uh, it's a mail order house, and from 1908 to 1940, they offered 370 home designs that you could buy through their mail order catalog. And during that time, they sold 70,000 of them. And once purchased, all the material was again loaded up and shipped to you by train, and including the blueprints on the railroad cars. And they could really be built on site in less than 90 days because it was so prefab and pre-built. And everything was, everything there was there except the plumbing and the electricity. You had to provide that yourself through, through your local sources. And this one, like I say, is in beautiful shape. It's just a mile or two down from Old Betsy. And the lady who owns that bought it with the full intention of restoring it back to the original as much as possible. And she contacted Sears and Roebuck and found a, a person through a lot of hard work, found a person who actually helped design these houses for the catalog. And so he helped her on some questions to make sure it was perfect. Okay, um, not the, well, I guess it's time to get political now. You know, it's a, uh, there's, there's some things you just gotta discuss if you're in Maine. And one of them is a whoopie pie. Okay, is that from Pennsylvania or is it from Maine? Maine? Of course it is, right, we all know that. But I have some friends from Pennsylvania who also claim, <laughs> claim it. But well, you know, while the treat was made in kitchens throughout Maine and as well as Pennsylvania, Labadee's Bakery here in Lewiston was the first one to commercially sell it and package it. So they're, they're kind of given credit, even though these were baked for your family at home, you know, mom in the kitchen. Um, 
Labadees was the first to package them and sell them. And they're still very, very popular, Labadees is. And they've, uh, they, they started that in 1925. And with less than, with less than 10 employees, they, they package and make and package about a million of these things a year. And most of all, the sales are in Maine. The bakery has been in that same location since 1925. And they also sell other good things. Yeah, they're a full, full-fledged bakery, so you can go in. And, uh, the day we went in there, it was a two for Tuesday, or two for Thursday. And so you got uh, two, two for the price of one. Of the, for, so we, we enjoyed ourselves. Okay, Paul Bunyan, of course you've all heard of Paul, and he was at a region now up near Rumford called the River Valley way back when. And he felt before, he loved the area, but he and Blue, the ox, decided that before they went around, or before they settled in one place, they'd go around the entire valley and see maybe there was even a better place. Well, they visited these 10 different locations. Yeah, I don't know if you can read them or not, but these are all within the valley, and they are long distance away from each other. So they both got very tired. So Paul decided that he would build a chair in each location, and he would sit in the chair and enjoy that location with Blue laying next to him, and they would figure it out, which, and they ended up going back to Rumford uh, and built even a bigger chair. Uh, and right now, there's the thing called the Paul Bunyan Trail, uh, the trails, the chair, excuse me, trail of the Paul Bunyan chairs, and you can get the, go online and find the, the tour, or you can go to the Rumford Chamber of Commerce right there by the, by the river and the falls in Rumford. And speaking of Paul, he's up in Bangor, 31 foot tall statue, he's the largest Paul Bunyan in the state. This was dedicated for his 125th birthday in 1959. And, you know, you, people say, well, why, why Bangor of all places? Well, by the 1850s, Bangor was considered, Bangor, excuse me, was considered the lumber capital of the world. Uh, the harbor was just stacked full of, sh of ships coming in for lumber. So it makes sense that Paul Bunyan would have been born in Bangor. And don't believe all the bunk that Paul Bunyan wasn't born in Maine. Because if you go up there in, in the city hall, yeah, yeah, city hall I think it's called, uh, there's a birth certificate proving that Paul was born on February 12th, 1834. And you laugh, you don't believe this. All right. And the, but the legend has it that he was so big at birth that it took five storks to deliver him. Okay, from one giant to another, here's the other iconic figure in, in Maine, the old salt. He's 25 feet tall, Booth Bay Harbor. He's at Captain Brown at Brown's Wharf. So this is, this is Captain Brown. He's the oldest, the tallest uh, old salt in the state since 1968. Then from a giant fisherman, let's go to a giant troll. These are at the Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens. And they brought this guy in where he built five giants. They're all on display and they're make it, made of recycled wood. Uh, some brought in, but a lot of it from the forest in that particular area. And they were built on site. And the neat thing about this is they were meant to wither away. So they'll be there until they start falling apart, and withering away over the years. They'll crumble in peace, in place, showing the value of the restorative nature of wood and the woods. And they've got a really fun story to go along with. If you haven't seen these, it's worth a drive over to Booth Bay to see these. They're, they're magnificent. You can see the little girls, how tall they are. And speaking of trees, isn't it great when trees wave back at you when you go down there? <laughs> this one is up in Farmington. <laughs> and I don't know who this guy is. They didn't have a sign. No. Uh, Bernard Langless. Uh, a great, great folk artist uh, built giant figures out of wood. Uh, and he taught up at the Skowhegan School and was a student up there. And so he, his original homestead and studios were in Cushing. And he's got a small display 
uh, in situ. They were actually built there and moved to that location uh, from his workshop just across the, uh, the pond there. And, um, but big, there's over 200 of them on display in Maine now. Um, Colby College up in Waterville is kind of like in charge of them all. A lot of them are up in Skowhegan. And the, uh, but you, again, you can go online and get a, 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 a tr driving tour of where all of his stuff is. And that's really, if you like bigger than big and amazing stuff that sometimes you have to think, okay, is this art or what? Uh, this, this guy is amazing, he really is. Oh, and there's three more guys waving at us up in uh, Peru. I, I love folk art. It's, uh, I can just see the guy spending, probably with a pipe in his mouth, cut, trimming these things out and painting them. And this moose stands proudly in Bingham, or very, on, on or very near the 45th parallel. And other towns in, in Maine that have little monuments to the 45th parallel are Perry Dex.
And, but the Lions Club and the fire department and police department of Holton really care for it. And during the winter time, they dismantle him or take him off the statue uh, base there. And you can see up in the right hand corner, that's a firehouse. They take him up there and uh, cover him up in the winter time and uh, decorate him for Christmas. <laughs> if you've never been to the Coal Land Transportation Museum in Bangor, get up there. This is, a, this is my, favorite, my favorite museum in the state. It's got 200 vehicles and other main transportation-related transportation artifacts. And it's, a, it's really a history of the state's land-based transportation system through many, many years, through many decades. And it's a true back-in-time experience conveyed by antique as well as well-restored vehicles. They have old trucks, vintage cars, they have motorcycles, trains, farm equipment. They've got the very first snow plows that plowed this, uh, the states um, up in the county, up there, um, the roads in the wintertime. A whole display of those along one wall. They've even got the first skidoo sold in Maine. And one cool thing is that they really are careful with the provenance. So we actually know from the skidoo, for example, who built it, where it was sold, how much it sold for, and who bought it. And so it's, they, it's like you're getting to know th the personalities of people who also helped contribute to the transportation community. I've never seen a better documented museum anywhere I've traveled. Another museum, while we're looking at them, is the Maine Mineral and Gem Museum in Bethel. This is a New York City quality museum. Definitely. Uh, they have more lunar and Martian meteorites than any other collection in the world. And they also include the five largest chunks of the moon found on Earth. A 32-pound Martian rock is also on display and is the oldest piece of Mars that has been known to be found on Earth. What do you do if you're Stephen and Tab Tabitha King living in Bangor and your favorite ash tree dies in the backyard? You hire a chainsaw artist to come in and with Tabitha, with Tabitha standing by his side, carved out this amazing piece of art. Uh, it's, it's the sculpture and features books, of course, but it also has animals, owls, birds, cats, frogs. And then you can see at the, I don't know if you can see very well here, but the only thing with any color at all, other than the brown, are the blackbirds at the top. They're, that fits right into the, the king motif, for sure. That's me standing there. Kathleen took this photo of me. This is, this is Daggett Rock. And it's the largest glacial erratic stone in the state and one of the largest in the world. And a glacial erratic is a rock that is out of place, totally dissimilar to its current location, meaning that the glacier obviously pushed it along with it. This 8,000 ton, 50 foot tall uh, stone, which you can climb up on in the back, there's some broken pieces. Uh, this was carried on a glacier from Saddleback Mountain, 12 miles away, and then deposited when the glacier receded. And another glacial erratic is this one, Balance Rock in Bar Harbor. It was left behind at the end of the last ice age. And um, geologists speculate that its origin is 40 miles northwest of here, uh, just south of Bangor, in a little community called Lucerne. Uh, the Great Main Aqueduct, that's what I like to call it. Actually. It's a, uh, it's a Route 1 crossing over the Duck River. And back in 1930, yeah, the, the original bridge was built in 1919. That's the bottom layer. And back in 1932, when the state decided to try to bring all of its bridges and elevations uh, at the same level across the state, um, they they were required to build a second bridge at the top. So instead of tearing the old one out, they just used that as a support to build the second bridge on top, which is quite unique.
This is the coolest piece of programmatic architecture I saw in the state during all of our research. It's the bluest and the biggest blueberry in town. <laughs> uh, and the inside is a bakery, and they bake some of the best blueberry pies and scones uh, in, in the area. It's located in Columbia Falls, just a few miles up the road from the blueberry capital of the world, which happens to be in Cherry Field. <laughs> and that's uh, it's on the main street of an area called basically the wild blueberry fields of, of the state. Uh, and it's a fun experience. They have a little museum inside as well. They did have a, a blueberry themed miniature golf course and they've kind of let the, the weeds grow over that now, unfortunately. That was a lot of fun. Colburn Shoe Store in Belfast is the oldest shoe store in the state of Maine been operating since 1832, and the ownership has been in only two families during that entire time. Passing it down, selling it to somebody. The, the guy that's there now, uh, his name's Colby, and he, he took over about five years ago from his father. And uh, believe me, it's, it's just not a, um, just a relic. It's still a very viable shoe store. And in 2023, it was listed as one of the best shoe stores in the state. It was one of the top three uh, in Down East Magazine. So people are, you know, you go in and talk to them and just look around and uh, people are coming in and out all, all day long. It's, it's original, really nice. The main lobsterman statue. This was commissioned in 1939 for the New York World's Fair where it stood in the centerpiece of the main section within the Hall of States for the, the, uh, the World's Fair. And unfortunately, after it was carved, the state didn't have enough money to have it bronzed. So what they did is they took the uh, model that was created, the mold that was created, painted it bronze, put it in the, in the Hall of States, and put in sanctions, uh, ropes around it so that nobody could get close enough to see it was really painted. And then back in 1973, somebody remembered it and said, let's do this. So they uh, bronzed three of the, uh, the molds. <clears throat> and today all of them are still on display. One of them is at, in Land's Inn at the very end of Bailey's Island. Uh, the other one is in uh, Lobsterman's Park in downtown Portland on, on uh, Temple Street. And the other one is in the wharf area of Washington, D.C. Very visible from the restaurant and people, and it says a Maine Lobsterman. It's, it's a, up in Lubeck, the West Quaddy Lighthouse, it's built on the easternmost tip of the U.S. And it's the closest place in the U.S. to Africa. So that's kind of fun. Uh, it's the, when you're standing at the lighthouse, you're only 3,154 miles from Morocco. <laughs> now, talk, this is part of the funky part of my book. Uh, I drove by one, I thought, that, that mailbox is mounted on a lawnmower. <laughs> And then a little bit further, there was another one. And then there was, they're all over the place. This is, this is right up in Fort Kent, Madawaska area. And, and I finally had to ask somebody, why? And he looked at me like I was asking the stupidest question in the world. He says, well, we get about 100 inches of snow up here. And he says, when the snow plows come by, they have a tendency to bury your mailbox. So he says, what we do is we roll these out. If we know there's a storm coming, we just roll them back in the garage. <laughs> Yankee ingenuity, huh? <laughs> now this one, I have no idea what was going on there. Upside down mailbox on a paddle with the opening. Again, I asked the guy across the street. He says, I don't know, it's just like him. So uh, he wasn't going to talk anymore about the eccentricity of the man, I guess. But talking about uh, eccentricities, there's a Wilton's um, from the Wilton Farmhouse Museum. This is Sylvia Hardy. 
She's the, considered the celebrated giantess of Maine and the wonder of America, as P.T. Barnum called her. And she traveled with him and got her fame and fortune with him over the years. She was, he attracted, he promoted her as eight, over eight foot tall, when in reality she was just about seven foot. But, you know, Barnum got away with that. But she's exhibited in, in the Wilton Farm Museum in a, uh, a second floor area. And the whole area is all her stuff. And she's, she died in uh, 1888 and was buried right there in Lakeview Cemetery. She was 65 when she died. So for a giant, she, she lived quite well. Siesta Sanctuary in Harmony is an assisted living facility for retired parrots. <laughs> it's a house in a private home. The day we visited, the place was literally for the birds. There's like 40 parrots all living together in a flock on the first floor of the house. And this lady collects these from people. She's given these from people just to save them. Um, because, you know, parrots last a lot longer than a lot of people. And so what do you do? You know, the grandkids, the kids don't want one. So she will take them. And you can't, uh, she, and th this is their life home. She will not sell them or not give them away, but she does have an open house a couple times a year that you can go in and play with them and talk to them. And uh, we, we had a good time in there. Loud, take earplugs if you go. You can not imagine the squawking. Uh, but it, it's, a, uh, it's an amazing expense, I'm sure, for this one man and woman to, to take this on to themselves. So it's up in harmony. It's called Siesta Sanctuary. In Fort Kent, it's the first, first mile of Route 1 that goes all the way down to Key West, Florida. It's a, the longest single route on the East Coast. And so if you start in Fort Kent and head south, this is the beginning. If you drive from Key West up to here, this is the end. It's on the flip side of the, uh, and it's 2,390 miles. And there's some description about that because there's a, a sign across the, uh, the street that says, I think something like 24 and 10. I don't, but uh, we'll believe this one since we have it in print. And so that's the last mile of Route 1, and that's the last slide of my, and um, I hope that uh, you enjoyed it. And any questions, I'd be lo I'd love to hear, hear what you have to say about Maine. If you got any ideas that should have been in the book, that I might have missed. Yeah. Yes, sir. Harry's Nut House. It is nothing like it used to be. I don't know how, when was the last time you were in there. You have to go back in time. Yes, you would. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah the, but the old elephant that they had in there is on top of the th movie theater in Belfast. Now they've got that up there, but it's, um, I, I wanted so badly to put this in the book, but it's just not like it used to be. And I mean, we started coming up probably 20 years ago and it was fun. And then I guess they went bankrupt, sold it, person bought it, and then is trying to build it back. But it's, uh, uh, but I do have a, uh, there's a jewelry store, Bennett's Jewelry Store right next to it. And they have a stainless or a, uh, a steel uh, uh, dinosaur uh, painted a wild pink, and that they call that Pink Floyd. <laughs> and that's so that's where the trip to Perry is just to see that. It's the welding students at Skowhegan High School made it for her after she told them she loved pink dinosaurs. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, this no, go ahead. Well, Len Libby's chocolate mousse. Yeah, yeah. That one's good. It it is in Scarborough. Scarborough, yeah. Yeah, it's life, almost life size. It's in the book. Oh, you know, the book, yeah, so. we have the book. Yeah, um, the but they limited my talk to only about an hour, so I've had sure. to. <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, and then now they've got a couple. I got a, like a little uh, brown bear, also, mm. keeping company for. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, did you do the elephant's grave in Sanford? El oh, uh, not not in Sanford. Oh, Alfred, sorry, yes. In Alfred, yeah, Alfred Ford, that's yeah. my old bets. I think is the name oh, of the elephant was. Was that the county jail? Yeah, now. yeah, exactly. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I I got that. I'm 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 a big P.T. Barnum circus and elephant fan. So when I heard about that, we tracked it is down. That in the book, it's in the book. Okay. Yeah. 
Y yes. In the with the uh, fountain in Holton of the boy with the leaking boot, you said there were other fountains around the country, like six of them. Uh, twenty eight, twenty nine, I believe. Twenty nine. Do they all look like that little boy? Is yep. it the same cast? Yep, but they put them in different fountains. Uh, we oh, just, so the horses fountain is unique to Yes, that. very unique to that. Yeah, there was, uh, we just saw driving up to Maine uh, last week, we went through Mount Vernon, Ohio, and they have one exactly like that, but a, a different a different type of fountain. But the exact replica of the boots, uh, they're all cast from the same mold, but it's amazing that nobody has records of where they came from or who made them or whatever. And Holton, Holton officials couldn't even tell us who actually installed that to start with back in 1919. So, I mentioned the Wiggly Bridge. Is that in the book? I'm sorry? I mentioned the Wiggly Bridge to you earlier. Is that in the book? No, it didn't. No. I've got the one in Brunswick. Uh, and then, the, of course, a wire bridge up in New Portland. But uh, I didn't get, like, telling you the story that could never find a parking space to get to the Wiggly yeah. Bridge. And didn't want to get ticketed. So, <laughs> do you uh, cover the solar system up in Arista County? I do it's in the book, and it's uh, quite unique. I was disappointed with the sun. The sun's just painted against the wall on a, at the university in Press Isle, and but it's it's hard to get a picture of Mars when it's on a ten foot pole and it's only that big around. <laughs> okay, well. Thanks for coming, and we do have books for sale if you uh, for 25 bucks a piece. And you, you people at home watching, uh, you can follow that address on the bottom there, Casa Flamingo Literary Arts, dot uh, com, and you can buy the book there, or you can buy it on Amazon or at Sherman's. Thank you. Thank you.